Good morning, everyone. How are you today? It's a beautiful day over here in Virginia. I hope your day is well, as well. Um, I'm running a little bit behind this morning. I looked up the clock about 10 minutes ago and said, wow, it's nearly nine o'clock. I better uh, take action. So it's good to be with you this morning. Thank you for coming by. Um, if you're out there, just send me a hello uh, and I'll see it. It'd be nice to know who's looking or who's on board. So last night in our um, Zoom meeting, book discussion on a book written by Neil Donald Walsh called Conversations with God, uh, we came to the subject of uh, what is hell. And it's very interesting as, as uh, God presents the answer to Neil in the book Conversations with God. And so I simply thought I would just share it with you today. Um, it's a couple of pages. And um, I hope you um, appreciate it. And uh, we'll just start out and move forward. And so the way this book is written, oops, there we go. It is written with Neil asking questions of God, he asked a question. He asked the initial question was, what does it all matter? I might just as well uh, be done with this life. And in an automatic writing experience, God responded. And so the whole book, and in fact, the whole series of seven books total, I believe, um, is written in that way with Neil uh, posing questions and getting a response um, from God. So it's Neil going, well, God, what about this? And God's response to Neil um, on those questions. And so the question that's on page 40 in the book is, well, what is hell? Neil, Neil asks God, well, what is hell? And God says, it is the experience of the worst possible outcome of your choices, decisions, and creations. It is the natural consequences of any thought which denies God or says no to who you are in relationship to God. It is the pain you suffer through wrong thinking. Yet even the term wrong thinking is a misnomer because there is no such thing as that which is wrong. Hell is the opposite of joy. It is unfulfillment. It is knowing who and what you are and failing to experience that. It is being less. That is hell. And there is none greater for your soul. But hell does not exist as this place you have fantasized, where you burn in some everlasting fire or exist in some state of everlasting torment. What purpose could that be? Even if I did, says God, hold the extraordinarily ungodly thought that you did not deserve heaven, why would I have a need to seek some kind of revenge or punishment for your failing? Wouldn't it be a simple matter for me to just dispose of you? What vengeful part of me would require that I subject you to eternal suffering or a type of a type and at a level beyond description? If you answer the need is justice, would not a simple denial of communion with me in heaven serve the ends of justice? Is the unending infl infliction of pain also required? I tell you, there is no such experience after death as you have constructed in your fear-based theologies. Yet, there is an experience of the soul so unhappy, 
so incomplete, so less than whole, so separate from God, God's greatest joy that to your soul, this would be hell. But I tell you, I do not send you there, nor do I cause this experience to be visited upon you. You yourself create this experience whenever and however you separate yourself from your own highest thought about you. You yourself create the experience whenever you deny yourself, whenever you reject who and what you really are. Yet even the experience is never eternal. It cannot be. For it is not my plan that you shall be separated from me, says God, forever and ever. Indeed, such a thing is an, is an impossibility. For to achieve such an event, not only would you have to deny who you are, I, said God, would have to as well. This I will never do. And so long as one of us holds the truth about you, the truth about you shall ultimately prevail. And Neil says to God, but if there's no hell, does that mean I can do what I want, act as I wish, commit any act without fear of retribution? And God responds, it is fear that you need in order to be, do, and have what is in, is, cancel that, start over. And so God says to Neil, is it fear that you need in order to be, do, and have what is intrinsically right? Must you be threatened in order to be good? And what is being good? Who gets to have the final say about that? Who sets the guidelines? Who makes the rules? I tell you this, you are your own rule maker. You set the guidelines, said God, and you decide how well you have done and how well you are doing. For you are the one who has decided who and what you really are and who you want to be. I lost my place. And you are the only one so, and who you want to be, and you are the only one who can assess how well you are doing. No one else will judge you ever for why and how. Could God judge God's own creation and call it bad? If I wanted you to be and do everything perfectly, I would have left you in a state of total perfection whence you came. The whole point of the process was for you to discover yourself, create yourself as you truly are and as you truly wish to be. Yet, you could not be that unless you also had a choice to do something else. Free will, ladies and gentlemen. Should I therefore punish you for making a choice that I myself have laid before you? If I did not want you to make the second choice, why would I create other than the first choice? This is a question you must ask yourself before you would assign me, God, the role of being a condemning God. The direct answer to your question is yes. You may do as you wish without fear of retribution. It may serve you, however, to be aware of consequences. Consequences are results, natural outcomes. These are not at all the same as retributions or punishments. Outcomes are simply that. 
They are what results from the natural application of natural laws. Touch a hot stove, you get a burn. They are that which occurs quite predictably as a consequence of what has occurred. All physical life functions in accordance with natural laws. Once you remember these laws and apply them, you have mastered life at the physical level. What seems like punishment to you or what you would call evil or bad luck is nothing more than a natural law asserting itself. And so then Neil asks, then if I were to know these laws and obey them, I would never have a moment's trouble again. Is that what you're telling me, God? And God replies, you would never experience yourself as being in what you call trouble. You would not understand, it canceled that. You would not understand any life situation to be a problem. You would not encounter any circumstances with trepidation. You would put an end to all worry, doubt, and fear. You would live as you fantasize Adam and Eve lived, not as disembodied spirits in the realm of the absolute, but embodied spirits in the realm of the relative. Yet, you would have all the freedom, all the joy, all the peace, and all the wisdom, understanding, and power of the spirit that you are, you would be fully, you would be a fully realized being. This is the goal of my soul, of your soul. This is the purpose, to fully realize itself in the body, to become the embodiment of all that really is. This is my plan for you, says God. This is my ideal that I should become realized through you, that thus concept is turned into experience, and I might know myself, says God, experientially. Have you ever seen anything more perfect than a snowflake? Its intricacies, its design, its symmetry, its conformity to itself, and originality from all else, all are a mystery. You wonder at the miracle of this awesome display of nature, yet if I can do this with a single snowflake, what think you can I do or have done with the universe? Were you to see the symmetry of it, the perfection of its design, from the largest body to the smallest particle in the universe, you would not be able to hold the truth of it in your reality. Even now, as you get glimpses of it, you cannot yet imagine or understand its implications. Yet, you can know there are implications, far more complex and far more extraordinary than your present comprehension and embrace. Shakespeare said it wonderfully. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And Neil says, then how, how, then how can I know these laws? How can I learn them? And God says, it's not a question of learning them, Neil, but of remembering them. And therein lies the whole solution, the remembering of who it is I am. I am the presence of God wherever I am. I am manifest in God's liking. I am manifest with dominion 
over this three-dimensional plane. It manifests in front of me as I create it. And I am in the free will, three-dimensional realm with all possibility present to me. The same is so for everyone hearing these words. Wherever you are, in whatever condition, the opportunity is available to realize yourself as the presence of God and act accordingly as you move forward. This is the practice of the life of a human being. This is the practice of the life given to us. How you get there is in fact completely of your choice. Yet to simply stagnate in a place going, oh, that sounds pretty. From this teacher's point of view is a living hell. I love you. I appreciate you. I acknowledge the presence of God as you and all is well. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.